Aristotle is credited with coining the phrase, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Now, if you want to know what that looks like, how, how to illustrate that, I think all you need to do is look at a mosaic. Now, let's take, for instance, um, you have a box full of tiles, brightly colored glass tiles, um, and those tiles have an, an inherent value. Depending on the method that was used to create them or the materials that they are made with, they have a value. Each individual tile is worth something by itself. Now, you could take all of those tiles in a box, and you can add up all of their value. Let's say, for instance, they, we say, well, all the tiles together individually, they add up to the sum total of their value is $100. Then you have an artist that comes along that understands the use of color and texture and shade and uh, how they all play well together or not so well together. And then that artist takes all of those tiles and they bring all of their intentionality and their and their creativity to that, and they lay that tile out in a certain way that an image begins to emerge. And, uh, and what you have is you took a $100 box of tiles and you create something now worth $100,000 because the whole is greater than the sum of, a part, of its parts. And that's, that's what we have with the mosaic. And we've been using this image of a mosaic to kind of illustrate the value of all four books of what we call the Gospels. Now, every one of those books has an inherent value in and of itself. It's, it's a wonderful thing. They're all very individually very, very valuable. We need them. Uh, but it's what they do together. It's what they do in conjunction with one another that work together to comprise a complete, whole, beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. So by themselves, they have a worth. But it's what they do together gives us something of infinite worth. Now, as wonderful as each book is, what we have to recognize is that no one book can adequately and completely give us a, a total picture of who Jesus is. Not every book can speak to every possible audience. And so we're very grateful that the early church understood that and they resisted the temptation to combine all of these accounts into one big gospel because they understood the value of the different perspectives. They understood the value of the unique voices that every one of the authors brought to this because they all wrote from a different background. They all had different history and they all wrote to a different audience. And so we need all of these working together to get this complete image. And so I know some of you haven't been here, so let me give you just a quick recap of what we have learned so far as we go through each of these different books. We started with the book of Matthew. It starts off at the very beginning. And Matthew, his, his goal is to convince his readers that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. And what we mean by that is he is the king, the ruler, the supreme ruler of over all things. Not just a king, not just the next king, but as the Messiah, he is God's final king. And he, he is writing to, we know, a primarily Jewish audience because of the, the language that he uses and the terms that he employs. And he, he leans heavily into the Old Testament prophecies and shows how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament prophecies. But he also cites the genealogy of Jesus. And so through the genealogy and the prophecies, Matthew gives us a picture of a king of destiny. He was meant to be king and, and, and he fulfills all of those prophecies. Then we get to, to Mark. And Mark Mark wants you to know that he's king. He wants you to also be convinced that he's Messiah, but he's not writing to the Jews. He's writing to the Romans. In fact, he's writing to people living in Rome. And if you're a Roman in the first century, what is your love language? It's power. It's authority. And so when you read through Mark, you see Jesus always moving, always doing, always accomplishing, and he's, he's exhibiting his authority, his power through his miracles. And those are a big factor in the book of Mark because he's trying to convince you of his authority, of his supremacy over the natural, the supernatural, over disease and death. And so he gives us all kinds of examples of that because that is what's going to get the attention of a Roman audience. And then we get to Luke, and Luke gives us a picture of a king, but he's a different kind of king. He's not a king that rules with power and authority, but one that sets aside his power and authority in order to save. He is a king of mercy, a king of compassion, a king of love. And Mark is writing really to a Gentile Greek audience. Remember, Mark was the first non-Greek, he's a Gentile, writing to another Gentile. And he, he also, I didn't, I didn't mention this last time, he also uses a genealogy, but he doesn't start, unlike 
Matthew, he doesn't start with Abraham because Abraham was the beginning of the Jewish nation. Luke goes all the way back to Adam. You know why he goes all the way back to Adam? Because he's sending a message that this was a Messiah, not just for the Jewish people, but for all of people, for all of creation, because he goes all the way back to the beginning. And he's a king of mercy. And then we come to John. And here's the thing about John. It's, he's so different, so unique. And we've used this picture of four-color processing because of this. You know, we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they are really the, the blue and the magenta and the yellow. And they, they fall into the category of colors because they all have a very similar pattern. And many of the things that they record overlap with one another. And then you have John. John is an outlier. John is in a category by himself. He really is the black, because black's not a color. Black is a shade, but you need the black to give shading and depth that really brings out the true picture. And so from the drop, from the very first words, we know John's going to be very, very different, because unlike the others, John doesn't begin with a prophecy, and he doesn't begin with history, and he does not begin with genealogy. John, John goes right to the heart of the theology of who Jesus is, and he says, in the beginning. Does that sound very familiar to anybody else? In the beginning. He is echoing Genesis chapter 1 1. And why does he do that? Because he's sending a message. See, in Genesis 1 1, God said, In the beginning. And it tells the story of creation. And John starts his account of the life of Jesus with the words, In the beginning, because he's about to tell the story of recreation, of what God's going to do to redeem the world in the beginning. Now you might think, well, clearly he's writing to the Jews, not so fast, because he starts off and he says, in the beginning was the word. Now this word is the original word uh, logos or logos, I mean, how you want to say it, L-O-G-O-S. And this was an important word both to the Gentiles, the Greeks, and the Jews. And what does it mean? Well, I mean, it's so complex, right? There's more to it than I ever give time for. But let me try to kind of unpack it just a little bit. When they heard the word logos, it was the word that, that communicated an eternal, unchanging truth. It was the word that, that, that comprised a universal wisdom, a, a power, if you will, that created the world, and it was a wisdom and it was a power that was available to whoever would seek it. And so he says, in the beginning was the word. He's talking about, and, he, and so he, he uses a word that is, is an important word to a lot of his audience. And so because of that, many of the uh, scholars believe he's writing to a dual audience, both to the Jews and the non-Jews, to Jews and Gentiles or Greeks, because this is a word that's important to all of them. He says, in the beginning was the word, but then he starts to turn and, he, and he's highlighting something that that is really stunningly unusual. He says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Now, the best way I can understand it and explain it is that to the Greeks and the Jews, when you talk about logos, right? What, what was that? It was kind of like the force, you know, in Star Wars. And what was the force? Well, the force was impersonal. Uh, it was nameless. It was faceless. It was just a power. Uh, it, it did not have personhood or personality. It just, it's the thing that everything kind of bound everything together, that made everything work together, right? And that's kind of how I see that, how they understood what the word was to them. It was kind of this nameless, faceless power that kind of created and bound and sustained the universe, but then he starts talking about this word in a way that no one else has talked about it before. The word was with God. The word was God. The word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. So this is not just, this is, this is what's different. This is what's revolutionary. This is what causes everyone to stand up and take notice. He goes, this is not just a universal wisdom. It's not just a comprehensive truth. This word became flesh and it says, and dwelled among us. The word there is, it's a strange word. He tabernacled. He, it was a, the idea of a tent. And so basically it's like the, the word came in and he, he had flesh and bone and he lived among us. The word moved in to the neighborhood. And so this was not a nameless 
power. This was not a faceless force. This was a power with a name and a force with a face. And this is important because Jesus is, I mean, John is giving us a picture of Jesus as, it's kind of like everybody in the world looked at nature and they said, there's got to be something beyond this. There's got to be something to this. There's got to be something outside of this, something, something divine, something transcendent. But in their mind, they never really thought about it as, as a personal force or power. And then John comes along and goes, that thing you have kind of been looking at, that nameless, faceless, generic power, that, that power has a face and a name, and his name is Jesus. And so this is important because that's how really John depicts Jesus. You begin to see some things as, as, as John is, is writing the story, how, do we, how does he show Jesus? Well, here's what John does differently than the others. And, and the thing about John is 92% of what you find in John is only in John. And he shows Jesus in a, in a way, he, he depicts Jesus in a light that the others really don't. See, the others, a lot of times you'll see Jesus giving uh, these discourses, right? These, these moments of corporate teaching where Jesus is standing on a boat and he's talking to a crowd or he's, you know, he's standing on a mountain, he's talking to a crowd and he's just, you know, he's just giving all this divine wisdom and, and he's teaching with great authority and he's, but he's always talking to the crowd in some of the other books. And, uh, and, and that's not the case with John. A lot of time when you see Jesus in his most profound teaching in the book of John, he's not talking to the crowd. He's talking to the person in front of him. It's through a conversation. It's through dialogue that we see Jesus. We, and he makes this transition. It's not the corporate Jesus. It's the personal Jesus that he depicts. A, 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 a Jesus you can know and you can relate to. This, this is a different kind of word than you've ever thought of before. And so in the other books, you don't even see the word parable, right? Because that, that was a lot of the subjects of his big corporate teachings were the parables. John didn't even use the word parable. He just focuses on the conversations that he has with individuals. And so he, he, you see, he's not, he's not teaching the crowd in front of him in John as much as he is talking to the person across from him. And he's not picky. He'll talk just about anybody. He talks to the most devout Jews and to the most wayward Samaritans, the saints and the sinners and everyone in between. And these conversations show us a side of Jesus that we just haven't really seen before in the other Gospels. And he knows this, and he, he's declaring this about himself. That's the thing about Jesus. The way John knows this about Jesus, because this is what Jesus tells us about himself. There are some, some people will, will read through the accounts of Jesus and say, you know, he never declared himself as God. He never claimed to be God. He did all the time. He didn't do it in the way you would want him to do it, but he did it in the way that the people that were listening to him understood him clearly to be declaring himself as God. In fact, there is a drumbeat that, that is, goes all the way through John of Jesus over and over and over again, emphatically declaring himself to be God, to be the word. And it's in his seven I am statements that's a part of the fabric of the book of John. So throughout the book of John, he has these seven statements where he declares, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. And every time he says, I am, what we have is an echo of the Old Testament where, where Moses shows up and God's there in the burning bush and Moses goes over and talks to God and God says, I'm going to use you to lead my people out of their slavery and their oppression. And Moses, you might know the story, he doesn't really go willingly and uh, he, he, he kind of resists God's will in his life. And Moses says to God, let's say I go. I love how he talks to God. Suppose I go. <laughs> this is hypothetically speaking, let's say I say yes to this crazy scheme of yours. Suppose I go to the Israelites and I say, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I tell them? And he's saying this, I can't represent you. I can't, I can't lead people in your name. I don't even know your name. What if they ask me a question I can't answer? What if they ask me, what is his name? He stands up and says, God sent me. And everybody goes, well, what's his name? What do I tell him? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. 
This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And from that, we have God's personal name. I am. And how do we interpret that? How do we understand that? Well, commonly, it's interpreted as a statement of God's self-existence. It means to be. I am. And he's saying, what God is saying to him is so remarkable is that I exist. And not only do I exist, I am the reason for my own existence. I depend on nothing else. I need no one else. I am totally, wholly self-sufficient. God has no beginning and no end and does not depend on anything for his existence other than his own self. And for him to say, I am, is a declaration of his deity saying, I exist. But in the Hebrew, the word to be does not just mean to exist, but to exist and to be active, to be present, to express oneself by actively being And when he says, I am, he says, I am God. I exist, but I don't just exist. I am God present and active. I am with you. And what do we see in Jesus? We see the fulfillment of that. Because who was Jesus? Well, Matthew tells us he was Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? It means God with us. And so Jesus is declaring this, I am And not only do I exist as God, I am now with you. I am active. I am present. I have moved into the neighborhood. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he is saying it over and over and over again. In fact, he says it so often that those who were really listening tried to kill him for it because they knew exactly what he was saying. He was being very explicit to his people, to his culture. But not only, he doesn't just declare that he is this word, that he is God. He also demonstrates that he is God. See, because alongside the seven I am statements of John, you have the seven signs of Jesus that John records throughout his book. And what are those signs? Well, changing water into wine healing the official son, healing the invalid, feeding the multitude, walking on water, healing the man born blind, raising Lazarus. And he, John says these are the signs that correspond with his identity. He is, in fact, God, and we know he's God. You know why? Because these are the things that he can do and the, what he does. And John, is, it's interesting, he uses the word sign and not just miracle. There are two different words there. And why does, God, why does John use the word sign? Well, what is a sign? A sign, by its very nature, is a smaller thing that points us to a greater reality. Think about it. Uh, You're driving down the road, and you come upon a sign on the side of the road, and that sign says, Fort Worth City Limits. Are you mistaken? Do 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 you jump out of the car and run up to the sign and go, whoa, Fort Worth, look at you not as big as I would have thought it would have been. No, it's, it's a reality, right? But it's a smaller thing that points to a greater thing. That's what a sign always does. And so John uses the word sign here because they're not just miracles. They were supernatural. They were miraculous. But in John's mind, as he looks at these things, they're not just miracles, they're messages. Because it's not just a display of power. He's trying to say something. Because what is the purpose of the sign? Well, according to the book of John, the purpose of a sign was to produce belief. The reason we have signs and the reason Jesus performed signs was so people would believe in him. Remember, I told you, all four of these books, there's there's a lot of difference in each one of them, but they all share the same subject and they all share the same agenda. The same subject is that they all present who Jesus Christ is. And the agenda is they all want you to believe in who he is. And John is the only one. We said this from the very beginning. John was the only one that explicitly says this. John chapter 20, Jesus performed many other signs, there's that word, in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Belief is a massive theme that runs all the way through the book of John. In fact, he uses the word belief 98 times throughout the whole of his book. 
what I love about that is John doesn't just expect everyone just to believe without a sign. Because in John, signs are what produce belief. Let me give you a few other examples. John 2. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing, and it resulted in they believing in his name. Uh, Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. John 7. Still, many in the crowd believed in him. They said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? Their point is this, like he's got to be the Messiah because the Messiah cannot do more than what he's already done. So what he's saying is signs produce belief. Jesus performed the signs to tell us who he was, not just a declaration of identity, but a demonstration of his identity so that we would believe in who he was, but that's not the end of the story. Because in John, signs don't just produce belief. Belief then, get this, produces life. Let me show you a few examples of that. How these tie together. John 3, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life. John 5, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. John 6, very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. This other idea of life along with belief, this is another huge theme that runs through the book of John. He, he uses that word life 36 times. He uses the word life more than two times than any other book in the entire New Testament. And it makes perfect sense because you go back to his his statement. Remember that statement of his purpose, why he's writing the book? In that statement of purpose, you find his formula. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So according to John, signs produce belief, and belief results in life. Because what he said at the beginning, in him was life. And that life was the light of man. This is who he was. It's what he came to bring us. Signs give us belief, and belief produces life. And and here's what I love. He, He admits it, even there in John 20. He performed a lot of signs. He did a lot of things in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. He's admitting, I didn't write everything down. But these are written that you might believe. I, I've chosen these because I want you to believe and I, and I want you to, to look at these signs because of what they say to us, what they show us, what these signs reveal to us because I want you to believe and in believing have life. And, uh, and so these, these signs that we do have of those, of those seven signs, there were more signs, but those seven, those were important ones. And I, I, I just want to take one. I want to take one and I want to just flesh it out and I want you to see what, he's, what he means by this. When he says, it's not a miracle, it's a message. It's a sign that points to a greater reality. I want to just take one, and I want you to see what he's talking about. And we're going to start with the very first one. I think it's the first one, and uh, it's, I, it's probably one of the most important ones. It's one of my favorite ones. It's found in John chapter 2. It's the, the moment where Jesus transforms the water into wine. John chapter 2. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. It's a big celebration. It's a great time. Everybody's having a good time until they're not. Suddenly, uh, there's trouble. There's a tragedy, in fact, if you will. Verse 3, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Now, some of us, that's a tragedy like, well, there's just no more wine. That's awful. But you have to understand what it means for that culture. See, your job, if you were a host, your job was to provide all the food and all the beverage for all of the people for all of the feast. And those feasts would last for many days, and they wouldn't just include your your immediate family. A lot of times it meant the whole community. So, I mean, there's a whole thing about Jewish marriages, and there's a time of betrothal, and, you know, they're kind of really legally married, but they don't really consummate the marriage until in the wedding. And, uh, and why is that? Because they take typically a year to prepare for the wedding. And in that year, they're working, they're saving, they're calculating, they're inviting, right? They're making all the plans and all the preparations to ensure that they don't run out of anything. 
because they need all of it. And so now they're having this wedding and the worst thing possible could happen. They are running out of wine. Now you have this young couple at the very beginning of their life. And what has happened is that their future is at risk because they've run out of wine. It's an honor culture. And now they risk having this shame attached to them forever because their family ran out of wine. And so when Mary comes to Jesus, this is, this is heavy stuff. This is a grave situation. She says to him, they have no more wine. Now, implied in the statement is, I know what you can do. And I'm asking you to do it. And he says, woman, why do you involve me? How do you t who talks to their mom that way? Woman, my hour has not yet come. It's not time for me to reveal myself to the world. That's what he means. My hour has not yet come. I should not reveal myself to the world. Why are you involving me? Here's what I love about this. She totally ignores him. She doesn't reason with him. She doesn't argue with him. She doesn't offer re rationalization, right? He says, my hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. <laughs> He's like, why, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. And she just kind of looks at him. She looks over at the servants and goes, you just do whatever he tells you to do. Because he's going to do something. <laughs> She's basically saying, you might be God, but I'm your mother. <laughs> and Jesus, as a good Jewish boy, he obeys, right? This says, <laughs> says so much about the dynamic between mothers and sons right now, doesn't it? Do whatever he tells you. Then he says, Near, uh, nearby stood six stone, six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Verse 6 is the key to unlock the whole thing. We'll see this in a minute. Jesus said to the servants, uh, fill the jars with water. So they filled them up. And they fill them up, and, and, and there's no, there's no thunderclap. There's no lightning strike. There's, there, there's, Jesus speaks no words. He doesn't touch the jars. Nothing happens. They just fill them up, and he says, now draw some out. Take it to the master of the banquet. He takes it to the master of the banquet. He tastes it. He says, this is great wine. People usually save the, the, the good wine for the first and the bad wine at the end. But he says, this is the best wine. Now, why does he do this? Why does he, and, and here, at the end, at the end, Jesus leaves, and God, he doesn't leave with any more followers than he showed up with. It's his first miracle, but hardly anyone notices anything happening. Very few people are in on it. So why does he do it? Well, Mary asks him to do it, and he obeys her. And really, honestly, I think that's the heart of it. Jesus honors his mother. And he goes, I got to do something now. I've got to obey my mother, but I want to make it count for something. I want it to mean something. So I just imagine, this is a little bit of speculation, but I see him kind of standing there looking around and he sees those six jars leaning against a wall and he tells the servants, go get those jars. And they go and they pull them out and he says, now fill them up to the, to the brim. Now, here's the key. Verse six, what were about these jars? Well, these jars tell us everything. They tell us, I think, they tell us what he came to do for us. This is the message he's sending through this miracle. Here's what I'm here for. This is why I'm here. This is what I came to do for you. Why is that? Well, these were a very specific kind of jar. They were the jars used by the Jews for ceremonial washing. This, these jars represented a religious system that Jesus came to dismantle. It was a religious system that was obsessed with appearances, with the, with the outside, right? And it was a system in which you went through all the ceremonies and the traditions, but they accomplished really nothing, right? You would, you would get your hands wet, but it didn't touch you. It, did, it, would, it would affect you externally, but not internally. It was a system that left you worse off than before. It was a system of oppression and fear and anxiety. And that's what he came to set us free from. And how did he do it? Well, he does it with an, an extravagant amount of grace and love and mercy. Look at what he does. He says, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. If each jar held on average 25 gallons, he has just created 150 gallons of wine near the end of the party. It's more wine than they will ever consume. More wine than they ever needed in the first place. It's a picture of what he came to do for us through his love and his grace and his mercy. He, he gives us more than we could have ever imagined. 
I came to set you free. Now, here's what's interesting. Remember I told you about Moses earlier? This is a big part of John 2. Um, Moses is talking to God, and he goes, what if they don't believe me? And what God does is he gives Moses what? He gives Moses signs. So Moses can perform certain signs, miraculous signs, to prove to the people that God did, in fact, call him. One of those signs, interestingly enough, had to do with water. You remember this? And so the sign that Moses had was Moses would draw some water from the Nile, he'd pour it out, and it would become blood. That was the sign. It was, it was a sign that transformed water into blood. Now, here's what's interesting. Moses sets up this system that Jesus came to dismantle. It was a system obsessed with the externals, a system obsessed with tradition and ceremony. It was a system that ultimately left you condemned. And so what you had was you had a sign, water being transformed into blood. It was a sign of judgment. And then Jesus comes, and Jesus, he performs his sign, and it's water being transformed into wine. It was a sign not of judgment, but of blessing. What he came to do for us was to set us free from religion that condemns and crushes. And how does he do it? Because of what he does in us. See, that's, what, that's the other part of the, the miracle that I think is so wonderful. The miracle happens and nobody notices. Why? Because it all happens internally. It happens inside the jar. When you become a Christian, there's a miracle that happens. Something supernatural takes place. But here's the sad news, right? Something amazing happens and you're going to go home and you're going to look at yourself in the mirror and you're a new creation. You're new. You're different. But you're not going to look any different or sound any different and you're going to weigh the same <laughs> and sound the same and look the same. You know why? Because what God has done in you, the miracle he has worked, is the miracle of the internal. The jar looks the same, but the contents of the jar are radically different. So he looks around and goes, I got to do something. I'm going to do a miracle here. I'm going to do a sign, right? I'm not going to do a miracle. Let me say it this way. I'm not going to do just a miracle. I'm going to do a sign, and I'm going to use this I'm going to send a message of what I came to do for you and what I have come to do in you. And it wraps up, and this is Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. That's what happens whenever we come to believe. He is, and, it's, and, it, and it doesn't, we think of glory as this big, dramatic kind of earth-shattering moment that just leaves us on our face, right? Power and light and, you know, majesty, that's glory. But God, God reveals his glory, and very few people notice because it's just what God does here. It's, and every time God reveals himself, even quietly to an individual, so much so that they now believe, and their life in that belief, they have now life. That is God revealing his glory every time he does it. And whenever God reveals his glory, we're different because of it. We're changed by it. And so John says this. It's his formula. Jesus is the I am. He is the word. A word not just of God's existence, but of God's activity, of God who's come to live with us, a God who's come to talk with us, a God who's come to relate to us. And we believe in him, and we have life through him. The signs produce belief, and the belief produces life. I love that book. But as we wrap up our series today, I want to point out one last thing. As we draw all of these things together, I want to go back, take one step back to the book of Luke. And we'll end with the words of Luke. The very first words of Luke, Luke chapter 1, verse 1, he begins his book by saying, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. And I want to highlight one thing in that statement. It's the word many. And I want you to consider just how significant that is. We grew up in a world in which Jesus is just a familiar part of it. We even peripherally know his name. We have some level of familiarity with his story. But I think we forget how incredibly unique and significant that word many is. 
When you look back through the pages of history, do you know how many people there have lived that in their moment in the sun, they were significant. They were wildly popular. They were widely feared. They were people of of incredible significance and influence. There were generals and leaders and rabbis and teachers and presidents, all right? They've lived in their time, and in their time, they were known by thousands of people, maybe even the majority of the world, but yet, over time, their their names have been lost to history. And even those names that we do know, even those names that are familiar, we don't realize that many of the names that we know and we look to in the past, they do not have as significant as they were, and even though we know them still today, they do not have even one written account of their life. We have pieced their lives through slivers and fragments of information from multiple sources together into a whole picture, but there is not one book that tells their whole story. But yet Jesus doesn't just have one book. He has many books. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of a first century Jewish peasant. And why? Why do people still know him? Why do people remember him? Why do they think he was so significant that it was worth writing down? Why in that day did they look at the life of Jesus and said, we have to preserve this for generations? Because he was so utterly, completely unique. So many people in our past, we have no idea. We have, there is no written comprehensive account of their life and their work. Yet we have Jesus. Jesus, who was born to a blue collar family in a backwater town. He never wrote a book, never led an army, never held an office, never had a family, never owned a home, never went to college, never lived in a big city. You know, he never traveled more than 200 miles from where he was born. None of the things that Jesus did accompanied greatness. He had no credentials but himself. Yet we know him today through these books today. Why? Because many, not just one, but many people saw enough in him that said it was important to write it all down so that you and I would have the chance to know him. And the question is, do you? And I said it from the very beginning. Some of you, you know a version of him. You've rejected a caricature of him. You've rejected a a kind of Jesus, but not really the real Jesus because you've never really looked into what these books had to say about him. I would encourage you to. If you don't, you owe it to him and to yourself to look at the whole picture, the complete mosaic of who Jesus Christ actually was through the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for those books. Thank you for preserving that account. Thank you for the many who gave of their time and the effort and those even who gave their life to preserve this book over the years so we can have it today. This book that sometimes we just ignore. Help us not to do it anymore. Help us to spend time with it, to walk with you through it, to know you from it. Ignite our hearts for it. We pray this in your name.